Welcome back to Aurora Tech Channel. Last week, I made a video to give a quick preview of the Maker Carvera desktop CNC machine. As expected, the machines with the $1,199 super early bird price did disappear pretty quickly once the campaign started. So I would like to congratulate you if you're one of the first 500 backers to secure the low price. But besides the super early bird offer, there are also 1,500 machines at $1,399. And while recording this video, about 600 of them are still available. And since this is a full review video, in case you didn't watch my last video, I'll just take two minutes to quickly go through the features of this Carvera CNC machine. This machine comes in one piece. All you need to do is take it out of the box and remove the packaging materials. Depending on what add-ons or packages you ordered, it may include the laser module, the four-axis rotary module, and different accessories. It has a working area of 300 by 200 millimeters with a Z height of 120 millimeters. The frame is a one-piece die-cast aluminum. The motion system uses dual 20 millimeter linear rods and ball screws on the X and Y axes, while the Z axis uses dual 15 millimeter linear rails and ball screws. The spindle is a 200 watt brushless spindle. Instead of an auto tool changer, it's equipped with a quick tool changer that uses the lever to quickly release and lock the tool in place, letting you switch tools in seconds. The bed is a waterproof MDF with threads, and it comes with two extra spoil boards for extra protection. It has an auto tool height setting gauge at the back of the bed. Once you change the tool, it will automatically set the tool height to continue the job. It also comes with a dust shoe to prevent dust and debris from flying everywhere, and you can connect your own shop vac to the port at the back of the machine. It uses its own controller software, which is available on Windows and Mac, and you can also use an Android phone to run the exact same app as a second controller screen mounted on the machine. You can use it to control the machine and start a job, just like how you use the PC software. I'll be testing this machine with various materials as well as optional accessories like the laser module and the fourth axis rotary module. I'll also give you a walkthrough of their CAM software in this review video. I would like to thank Makera for sending us this machine to review and for sponsoring today's video. And with that, let's get started. I'll start with this quarter inch walnut wood board. It's actually longer than the machine, but I'll secure it using the clamping tool that came with the machine. I'll use Fusion 360 to generate the toolpath for engraving and then run a contour to cut it out. Next, I'll upload the file from my computer to the Carvera controller software and open it after the upload is done. The preview and the origin of the file will good, so we can start the job. Since I've jogged the machine to the exact starting position, I'll select to start at the current position without having to set any offset. Now let's run the job. It will start by drawing a preview frame and probe the workpiece to set the Z height. Then I'll switch to an engraving bit, use the gauge to set the tool height, and start engraving. I won't put on the dust shoe for most tests as it's just easier to film without the dust shoe. After it's done, I'll clean it up with the shop vac before continuing the next job. Next, I'll change the flat end mill to cut the contour. The job finishes in about 10 minutes, with the engraving taking around 6.5 minutes and the cutout taking around 4 minutes. The engraving looks pretty good without any extra post-processing, and the cutout is clean. The back of the machine can open to fit an even longer stock, but it may not be the best idea to use something that long. Instead, I'll cut it down and use this wood block to make a tool holder. 
I'll make six larger pockets and three small ones, then add a chamfer on the edges. It starts with a preview frame. Then I'll use the flat end mill with a flint length of 25 millimeters, as I'm going to make all these pockets as deep as the tool length. Without using the dust shoe, the wood dust fills up the whole pocket, and I'll just use the vacuum to clean it up. Then, I'll change the chamfer tool to continue. The result looks not too bad. The thing I'm not too happy with is the chamfer. I forgot Fusion 360 will set the chamfer tip offset to 1mm as the cutter is 1mm away from the edge, resulting in the chamfer being a little narrower than what I prefer. I should set it to a zero offset so the center of the cutter will cut at the edge to make a wider chamfer. As a functional part, it works fine. Next. We'll try some soft metals, starting with 6061 aluminum. I'll make 10 slots on the aluminum plate. The cutting, as well as the plunge feed rate, are set to 200 mm per minute. Since the thickness of this plate is 1 8 of an inch, which is 3.175 mm, I'll cut all the way to negative 3.5 mm to ensure it cuts through completely. For the maximum step down, I'll start from 0.1 mm for the first slot and gradually increase it to 1 mm for the last one. The speed will stay at 200 mm per minute. Let's take a look at the simulation. As you can see for the slot operation, the 1 mm step down doesn't mean it will plunge down 1 mm all the way on each pass. Instead, it will go back and forth and progressively reach that 1 mm step down. This method is easier and more suitable for smaller machines. I'll also start the job slightly outside the bottom edge of the plate so we can see the slots more clearly. When working with aluminum, the sound level is louder than wood. With the cover open, it can reach up to the mid-70s in decibels. With the cover closed, it's around the mid to low 60s.
Okay, this is the final one. The chip size is much bigger, and it seems the machine can handle this one millimeter progressive step down without issues. They all look clean, even though the 0.1mm is cleaner, but I think the rest of them still look okay. I'll make two more pockets on this plate, keeping the same 200mm per minute cutting and plunge speed rate. The depth of the pocket is 2.5mm. For the step down, I'll set it to 0.3175mm. Unlike slotting operations, pocket operations will plunge down exactly 0.3175mm straight down instead of reaching the depth progressively. You can see it will run 8 passes, with each pass at a 0.3175mm depth to mill a 2.5mm pocket. For the size, the square is 20mm and the diameter of the circle is also 20mm. As you can see, the chip size of 0.3175mm is already pretty big, not far from the 1mm progressive step down of the slot operation. For pocket operation on aluminum, the sound level is higher. Without the cover, it can reach over 80 decibels. With the cover on, it's about 10 decibels lower. It's just a little louder than an unenclosed fast 3D printer. The pockets were finished without issues. Let's check the accuracy. Both the square and circle are very accurate. I think I can push it a bit harder, but I'm happy with the accuracy of this machine. I will also mill a logo and cut out on a brass plate. I'd like to make it like a coin, so I'll run a facing operation, using a 0.3mm set down with 5 passes to shave off 1.5mm from the plate. Then, I'll engrave the logo with a depth of 0.25mm. Finally, I'll run a contour operation with a 0.3mm step down to cut the coin out. I was supposed to put another MDF to protect the spoil board, but as the spoil board should be pretty cheap, I'll just leave it. As you can see, the plate completely cut through and leaves a cut on the spoil board. The result is pretty good. It could be even nicer if I make it double-sided. If so, I just have to cut a perfect square out of the brass plate first, engrave the logo at the center, and run the cutout contour and cut half of the thickness on one side, and repeat the same on the other side. It seems this machine can handle soft metals pretty well. I will also try to make a wrench with mild steel. 
I just bought some 2x4 inch steel plates on Amazon, which cost just $2 each. I will try to make the wrench fit within this small plate. I will use a 300 ml per minute feed rate for cutting and 50 ml per second for plunge. For the maximum step down, I will just set it to 0.05 mm. So, cutting this 3 ml thick steel plate will need 60 passes. That estimated time is 1 hour and 13 minutes, which is still acceptable. So, let's see how it does. The sound level of working with steel, while the 0.05mm step down, is similar to aluminum. This steel wrench finally finishes in 1 hour and 14 minutes. I have to stop the machine manually, as the middle of the steel plate was almost cut out completely, and the thin MDF can't support it anymore, resulting in the final 0.1mm not being able to be cut out completely. It is just like the brim on a 3D printed part, and I have to remove it manually. The rest of the cut is very clean, the edges are smooth, except for the bottom 0.1mm brim that I had to cut off manually. This 20mm steel wrench is also very accurate, and it's definitely a functional part. Up next, I will try working with acrylic. I'll make a Hello Kitty face and text on this 3mm acrylic plate and cut it out. When engraving on acrylic with a CNC, it may not be as clean as wood. As a result, even though acrylic is soft, you may need to do multiple passes and multiple cleanup passes to get good results. I'll engrave 0.5mm with 3 passes, totaling a 1.5mm depth. Then I'll run 3 cleanup passes to make the engraving look as clean as possible. Finally, I win a contour with a 1mm step down for 3 passes to completely cut this slightly less than 3mm thick acrylic. As you can see, the more passes you run, the clearer engraving you can get on the surface of the acrylic. Next, I'll try to make a PCB with the auto leveling enabled. If you have a dirty printer, you should be familiar with this process as the probe basically works like a BL touch. In fact, I should mount another clamp at this corner, as it seems like it lifted up a little. But this is just the edge, and we're going to cut it with multiple passes anyway, so it shouldn't be that big of a deal. When working with PCBs, there is a lot of fine dust. I have to vacuum it manually, as I didn't use the dust shoe for filming. Then, it will change to a corn bit for drilling, And finally, 
it's going to cut the whole PCB out and leave two tabs. As this is just a very simple PCB, doing some white engraving and cutting it up shouldn't be a problem for this machine. But I would like to do it again, this time with the dust shoe and connecting my shawl vat to the back of the machine to see the difference. With the dust shoe and the cover on, the sound of one working on soft material like PCB is just around 60 decibels. The results are basically the same, and the dust shoe collects all the dust. After soldering some resistors, LEDs, and other components, the PCB looks like this. Next, I will try the 5 watt laser module. You can just change it like a bit, connect one cable, and it's ready to use. Then it will use the same tool height gauge to set the focal length. I will just engrave a sample picture from the machine to test it out. Surprisingly, the quality of this ID card size photo is pretty good. I will also engrave some text on the back of the Gryffindor walnut wood I made earlier. As I haven't used a 5 watt module for 2 or 3 years, I will just try a 3000 mm per minute speed and 100% power. The result is a bit dark. I also tried 5000 mm per minute with 100% power. I've discovered that the maximum travel speed of the machine is set to 2000 mm per minute. This means that regardless of the speed I set, it will still be limited to 2000 mm per minute. So, I believe that for walnut wood, using a speed of 2000 mm per minute at 50% power would be best. Then, I will also try out the fourth axis. It will scan the working area of the job, and we just need to make sure the claw and the support end module will not be cut. Then, it's going to probe the left side of the module, as the system has a predefined offset from the top of the module to the center point. So no matter how large your object is, the center point won't change. It will start with the roughing operation with a 25mm long, 1 8 inch flat end mill. <laughs> The roughing took 44 minutes. We can basically see how it should look. Then I will clean up the mess and switch to the same 30 degree engraving bit for finishing. After a quick cleanup at the shop vac, the 3D model is completed and the details are pretty amazing. When compared to a standard 3D Benchy, you can see how small it is. Besides the sample job, I will also do another one and generate tool pads from Fusion 360. I will make a chess piece. The process will be very similar, starting with a 25mm long flat end mill for wrapping. Then I will switch to my own 1mm bowl end mill for finishing. I will just use this leftover oak cylinder that I used to test with the row ring roller of laser engravers.
the roughing operation isn't really rough. It looks like corn you took bites out of. We will now use a 1mm ball and mill for finishing. I used a 0.5mm step over for finishing, which turned out to be a bit too fast. The job finished in just 13 minutes. I prefer to use a 0.25mm step over, even though it would take double the time just to achieve a smoother surface. Despite this, the current result still looks okay. Finally, as Megara has also launched their own CAM software with this machine, it could be an alternative for those who are not familiar with Fusion 360 or the manufacturer workspace. Their simple CAM software allows you to perform simple jobs like engraving, cutting, and PCD milling. The interface of the software is straightforward. Instead of going through each button and feature individually, I take three minutes to demonstrate how to create a simple engraving and cutting project. Let's recreate the Hello Kitty design using their software. First, I will set the stock size and type. Let's say it's NDF, so I'll select softwood with dimensions of 120 by 100 millimeters and a thickness of 3 millimeters. Then, import the Hello Kitty SVG file. It may be placed far away from the origin. I'll use the keyboard shortcut M to move it back to the workspace and resize it to fit the stock. There are still confusing translations like zoom and link XYZ, which mean resize and maintain ratio. I'll scale it down to fit the stock. Additionally, the SVG file is mirrored, so I'll use the mirror tool to flip it back. After moving it to the center of the workspace, I'll add a rectangle to cut it out. I'll enter the dimensions as 100 by 80 and use the keyboard shortcut M to position it where I want. Now all the components are ready and we can generate toolpaths. Currently, the software only supports three types of toolpaths, vector contour, pocket, and ruling. In this example, we will create two different vector contour. Starting with the kitty graphic, I'll select the lines I need and enter 0.5mm for the depth of engraving. For this engraving job, I'll select the 30 degree engraving bit. Next, I'll set the step down to 2mm, which is more than enough as we only need to engrave 0.5mm on the workpiece. Then I'll click Calculate. It would be more clear if this button is called Generate or Save Toolpath. After I click this button, you can see we have a new toolpath generated here. For the cutout, instead of using the pull down menu or these buttons, I can also select a rectangle. Right click to bring up the menu and choose Toolpath, Vector Path, and Vector Contour. I'll enter a depth of 3.5mm for the 3mm NDF and select the short 1 8th inch flat and mill. I'll change the set down to 1 as we need to cut a 3.5mm depth, which will result in a 4 pass cut. After clicking Generate, we have another toolpath. We can now export the toolpaths, select both engraving and cutting toolpaths, and save them as a G-code file. Back in the controller software, we can upload the G-code file to the machine, set the offset according to the position of our workspace, and start the job. It will start by drawing a preview frame, probing the Z height, and starting the engraving. Then it will switch to the flat end mill and proceed with the cutting. For a simple job like this, it wouldn't make a big difference whether you use Fusion 360 or their CAM software. However, for more advanced features like 3D engraving and fourth axis toolpaths, they aren't supported yet. But Megara told me that these features should be ready when their final machines are delivered to customers. So let's wait and see. Okay, let's talk about the pros and cons of this machine, starting with the pros. 1. At first, I thought that not having the auto tool changer would be a big deal, but after I got familiar with the machine, changing tools with this quick tool change system is even faster. There's a button at the top for tool changing, which allows you to process tool changing without going back and forth from the computer. This is especially useful if you don't have a phone or tablet as a second controller on the machine. But of course, you still need to sit next to the machine and change the tool manually, while the auto tool changer on the flagship model can do everything by itself. 2. It supports bits with different shanks. By default, the 1 8 inch collet is installed, and all the bits that came with the machine have 1 8 inch shanks. It also came with 4 sets of collets that allow you to use different bits. 
Therefore, you can also use 4mm, 5mm, and quarter inch shank bits. 3. The whole machine is rigid. It uses a one piece die cast aluminum frame. It's better than any machine that requires you to use screws to put it together, as the one piece frame won't loosen over time. I can machine mild steel on this small desktop machine. Generally, I wouldn't expect a machine of this size to be able to work with steel. It's not fast, but it can still get the job done with pretty good results. 4. The motion system uses dual 20mm linear rods on the X and Y axis instead of linear rails, but as the rods are large, it can still hold the force from the spindle pretty well, and I can still use it to work with soft metal pretty aggressively. The result is not far from the $6,000 flagship model. 5. As a fully enclosed machine, when the cover is closed, it ensures that dust does not scatter everywhere and also reduces the sound level by about 10 decibels compared to when the cover is open. The noise level is relatively low when working with softer materials, making it suitable for use in offices or homes. However, when working with metal, the noise level is louder and it's not far from an open frame fast 3D printer. 6. The controller software works well. It's much better than other standard Gerbil CNC G-code senders and is customized for this machine. The program is cross-platform. If you choose to connect to the computer using a USB cable, you can use Wi-Fi to connect the app to a phone or another tablet as a remote controller. This makes using the machine really handy. Their own CAM software has also finally been launched, and it's easy to use, and it supports basic contour operations for engraving, cutting, and PCB milling. 7. It doesn't come with a built-in vacuum system, but it allows you to connect your own shop vac to the back of the machine. I connected my 6 horsepower shop vac, and the result is even better than the flagship model's built-in vacuum. With the same port at the back, I can also connect a smoke purifier when doing laser engraving. So in my opinion, I prefer this simple hose and connector setup over a built-in vacuum. Now for the cons. 1. The linear rails on the Z axis and the linear rods on the X and Y axis are all unprotected, unlike the flagship model where they're all protected by covers. Even if you don't use the dust shoe, it can effectively prevent dust and debris from getting into the motion system. When you're just using it as a three axis machine, it should be fine since you can always use the dust shoe. However, when you're using the fourth axis, the dust shoe won't fit. I believe that implementing some simple covers or bellows for the motion system won't cost much at all, so I think it should be a basic feature instead of being exclusively reserved for the flagship model. 2. The front cover of the enclosure is unsupported. If you let go of it, it can drop all the way down. It could be better to incorporate air pistons like those on the flagship machine to enhance the safety of this machine. Once again, the cost of a small air piston is minimal, making it a basic feature that should be included, and given that the cover of this Carvera Air is much lighter, just one piston would be enough. 3. The threads on the bed don't limit the length of the screws you can use, so when I used some screws slightly longer than the total thickness of the bed, this resulted in deep scratches on the machine and it stopped it from homing properly. Since this machine is designed to be beginner friendly, I believe steps could be taken during the manufacturing process to limit the maximum depth to which screws can be inserted into the bed. This would help prevent damage like the one I encountered. 4. Their CAM software is simple and user-friendly, which could be a huge advantage for someone without access to Fusion 360. However, currently, only basic 2D operations are possible with MakerOS' own CAM software, but they did tell me that the full version, including 3D engraving and 4th access capabilities, will be available when the machines are delivered to customers. 5. This is a Kickstarter campaign, so it offers a much lower price compared to the eventual retail price once the product becomes officially available. However, with an estimated delivery time of November this year, backers will have to wait another six months after the campaign ends in May. It'd be cool if Makera publishes a monthly newsletter during the waiting period with pictures and short videos, which would keep backers engaged and informed about the status of the project. Finally, I would like to offer a few suggestions to Makera. First, once the CAM software is fully functional with 3D engraving and 4th access toolpath enabled, they could consider making the software compatible with generic CNC machines at an affordable price. This would allow most budget CNC users to consider purchasing the software as well. Just as many laser engraver users are willing to spend extra money to buy Lightburn software, 
This move could take your brand value and popularity to a new level and expand into the software market. For additional features, I would also suggest that Makera can consider adding an optional mist cooling system and vacuum hold-down table in the future. In conclusion, this Carvera Air surpasses other desktop CNC machines in the market. Despite its smaller working area and lack of auto tool changer compared to the $6,000 flagship model, they both still offer advanced features and excellent build quality. With a few years of experience and user feedback, Makera has refined the design and some small details on this Carvera Air, making it even better than the flagship model in certain areas. I will include it on my recommendation list and award it the title of the best performing small size desktop CNC machine. You can find the link to their Kickstarter campaign, which already has over a thousand backers in the description. This marks the third CNC machine on my recommendation list out of dozens I reviewed. You can find the list on my website, auroratechchannel.com, which also provides hourly updates on the prices of over 150 machines with detailed specs for easy comparison. That's it for this video. If you found this video helpful, please give it a like and consider subscribing to our channel. Thank you for watching and I will see you next time.